As we begin the message this morning, we do want to give this heads up. The material might be sensitive for young children or whoever might be uh, sensitive to it. So we just want to give that heads up. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, we come to a topic today a little bit different from what we normally tackle. Help us, Father, to present the love of Jesus. The love that is to all people, to sinners. And we are all sinners. But at the same time, Jesus presented truth. And the Bible presents truth. So help us to do truth of Jesus, of you, of the Bible in love. We pray a special blessing on the message. I deliver it as you would have me to. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James Warren Jones was born in Crete, Indiana, and grew up in that region in the 1930s and 1940s. As a boy, he was characteristic, characterized as having an infatuation with death and the Bible. In high school, he carried a Bible with him all the time. He dressed like Sunday morning dress, which would be the jacket and tie, probably a white shirt. And he confronted those that drank beer, smoked, and danced. He graduated school early uh, with uh, honors, and amidst his outward appearance of Christianity, he attended meetings of the Communist Party USA. Marxism never left his thoughts, and he concluded that the best way to present Marxism is through a Christian ministry. Early on, he had an interest in Pentecostalism, uh, which was a rest uh, uh, he, he pursued the uh, Pentecostal Latter Reigns movement, which was a, part of the early Pentecostal movement, uh, which took place during the Great Awakening of our country, during the time of Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, and several of those preachers anyway. It was during this part of the 1950s and 60s that his popularity grew and he had a following. At that time, he was associated with the Independent Assemblies of God. Jones left the Assemblies of God in 1955 and founded the organization that later became the People's Temple, located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Along with his ministerial leadership, he took on civil rights as an activist and thus got a larger following. In 1964, Jones joined with the Disciples of Christ as a minister and was ordained into that organization. And in 1965, he moved the People's Temple to San Francisco, California, where he became involved politically and in charitable organizations during to the 1970s. By then, Jones had become vocal in his rejection of Christianity and began promoting an anti-capitalism view that he called apostolic socialism. His followers bought into the socialism and they began turning their income and their possessions over to Jones and the People's Temple. At the peak of Jones' movement, he had over 3,000 followers. In the 1970s, people started reporting abuse among Jones and the temple, and it was at that time that construction began in Jonestown, Guyana, as a commune. In 1978, uh, he had moved the people there. He had over 1,000 people with him. And in 1978, people began reporting that they were being held against their will. So California Representative Leo Ryan and four others were a delegation that went down to Guyana to investigate. And as they were boarding the airliner to come back to the States, 
Jones and his followers gunned them down. Jones immediately ordered the mass suicide, claiming the lives of 909 people, most of them drinking the sugar-flavored drink laced with cyanide. And many of us uh, remember the news of those days. Now, the brief summary of Jones' life reveals things that I hadn't even known before, that he never was solidly founded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he eventually led people not only to the physical deaths, but to their spiritual deaths also. So in this series, Be Ready, we want to uh, let you know that we're, we're trying to prepare all of us for what's coming. And in the last three sermons, we've prepared for salvation, to make sure that we are solidly grounded and safe within Jesus Christ by following his plan for becoming a Christian. But we need to be aware of the assault that Satan is presenting on us. He's leading the attack. But Satan is patient. He's cunning. He's deceitful. He's clever. He's sly. And he's devious. He doesn't really care how long it takes to get his way, as long as he's moving in the, his direction what he would consider the right direction, the wrong direction to us as Christians. He is in no hurry to destroy the church, but that's his goal. To destroy everything good, to destroy you and me. For those of us that have enough years behind us, we can see this disintegration of the church in our country. We go back to the 1980s when we saw TV evangelists, these mega evangelists that begin to fall, uh, sexual sins and money uh, stealing and so forth. And then we had the Catholic Church that got caught with sexual immorality with children and even known by the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. This was all starting to lead people to question the church, pastors and church leadership. And then there were more scandals of the mega churches as big leaders, preachers, pastors fell to sexual scandals. And in the past few decades, we're now starting to see where denominations are beginning to uh, introduce the acceptance of sin and homosexuality into their denominations. And then more recently led to these denominations introducing the approval of homosexual ministers and leadership. And today we have congregations splitting from these denominations at great cost. They have to purchase the property, they have to purchase their, their building from the denominations, thus aiding the denominations in their ways, but at the same time they're doing the right thing by separating themselves from it. The Apostle Paul warned against the times as we're facing. In his second letter to Timothy, he wrote about the events, that, like the tumultuous times that we're starting to see and we're beginning to face. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Uh, pay attention to how almost 2,000 years ago this description is fitting us today. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Now, I hope I didn't just describe you. I hope Paul didn't just describe you, but he described people that all of us know. We all know of people. We all work with them or know them in our community or watch them on the news. We all know these people. And as we look around, it's easy to see Paul's description of what we're talking about. And then Paul continues in verse 6. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women 
who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. These people prey on the weak. When Paul mentions gullible women, he wasn't talking about all women. He was talking about a specific group of women that they were immature and they were idle, having time on their hands. They were influenced by fads and fashions. Their curiosity, in their idle curiosity, they chased dreams of something different, something more, something more unique than what they had been in. Today, rather than saying gullible women, Paul would probably say gullible men and women who are immature and overly influenced in today's culture. These people do go after the latest fads, the latest fashions that come and go with the wind. They are naive. They go after the latest craze, the latest item, or the latest uh, thing that they see on TV or social media. They're immature, simple people, lacking self-control and self-discipline, eagerly seeking something new and different. When they see what their friends are doing or what somebody else has, they want it too because it's the trend. They want to be considered the in crowd. If their friends are buying into it, they have to have it. We try to, they try to be on the cutting edge of excitable thinking and style, but they're gullible. They're immature. They're weak-minded. And by the way, we've all been there at one time or another. These people easily fall prey to false teachers. And they bring their false teachings into the church, saying, well, we think this is okay. And they do so in the name of Jesus Christ. They argue that they're reaching people. They want to do this to reach lost people the way that Jesus would and the love of Jesus. But they're not satisfied with biblical truths. They're restless because they're not firmly founded in the biblical teachings. And they're easily swayed. And when you have people like Jim Jones stepping up or these other false teachers, you can see that they appeal to these people that are gullible and easy to let astray. So this morning we're looking at the topic of wolves invading the church. Now, understand that we are talking not about sinners, as we all are. We're talking about church leadership. We're talking about we've got to all beware as Christians about what's coming and what's happening. We'll deal with this a little bit more later. We're laying out the problem, then we'll look at the solution. So let's continue with the problem. We go back to Paul's letter, to the second letter of Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 3. He says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Now let me just pause here, because whatever you want to believe, you can find on the internet anymore. You can find a basis for it. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Many times people start wandering away from God when times are good. They have idle time on their hands. It's it's an easy distraction. Well, they're, they're, they're looking for something better. They're looking for something different, more adventurous alternatives, and so they're easily swayed by some of these things, and I won't have to mention them, but you can look around in our society and see the many causes of these people that they stand for. But the opposite is also true. When people face calamities, when people face hard times, whether they're caused by themselves or whether they're caused by natural disasters, hurricanes, for example, and tornadoes, floods, they also are gullible in many times, reaching out to anybody that's willing to help them. They turn to the government. They turn to false teachers. They turn to anybody that they can view as a hero to bail them out. And I'm not saying they don't need bailed out, but some of them bring on their own troubles. And these heroes of theirs make these false and glorious promises, never really intending to help them out. These people hang on to every word. Many times the promises never come true. They contain just enough truth to enslave those that join in following them, to keep them hanging on. 
Many pretend heroes prowl around, as Peter said, like a roaring lion seeking who they might devour. These false teachers or these liars are all around us. In 1994, a 67-year-old carpenter named Russell Herman died in Marion, Illinois. I want you to listen to his last will and testament. He left $2.4 billion to a town of Cave-In Rock, Illinois. Now, there really is a town by that name. I looked it up. It's along the Ohio River in Illinois. He left $2.4 billion to the city of East St. Louis, $1.5 billion for projects in southeastern Illinois, and to aid in the a financial deficit of our country, he left $6 trillion to the Federal Reserve. And, you know, every so often you hear about these rich people and you go, where'd they come from? Uh, well, the only thing that Mr. Herman owned was a 1983 old tornado. It was only in his dreams. It was only in his fascination of wanting to be known or to play a prank on somebody. He may not have left anything of value behind, but he did leave behind the lesson that some people are just out to deceive others. Could you imagine a town thinking that they're going to receive $2.4 billion from a nobody? And he really was a nobody. False teachers and liars never intend to keep their promises. This is the reality of false teachers. This is the reality of, of our government in many cases. Neither intends to give you the kind of support that you would like to have. Rather, they seek to take from you eventually rather than for you to gain from it. Now, just a lot of people depend upon the government. I'm on Social Security. I, I depend upon the government to an extent. But as of this last Wednesday, our national debt was, I'm going to round it off, $35 trillion, $689 billion dollars. And in the last four days, our debt went up by $10 billion. I got, a, I got an app on the phone, or it's on, uh, in, in the internet that's given a running tally of it. Now, Mary Lou said something about that Lifeline has packed, what, 100 million meals? Now, if my math is right, and please don't believe me, check it out yourself. $10 billion is 100, 100 million meals. 100, 100 million dollars in four days. You remember Greece a few years ago that collapsed? And where did they get their money to bail them out? They took from the people. The point is that our government is no different than a lot of these false teachers. Eventually, we're going to have to pay for this, and the government will come and take from you. This is the example of the false teachers, except the government takes a whole lot longer to get around to it, and the false teachers will betray you a lot sooner. They have no intentions of helping you. Their only intent is to deceive you. In the book of Genesis, Satan deceived Eve. We all know that story. Don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One rule, one law, yet they ate. And what happened? They realized that they'd been deceived. They weren't like God. Well, they knew right and wrong, that's for certain, but they, they didn't gain anything. Matter of fact, their world fell apart. And Satan left them dangling like a fishworm hanging over a pond full of hungry bass. They were devoured by Satan. And this is what false teachers do to us, and they've infiltrated the church. They come in the name of love and compassion, but they're watering down the Word of God. Let's, let's look at more Scripture here. Paul points out certain sins in his letter to the church at Corinth. Now, I understand the church at Corinth was the crossroads of immorality. It was one of the most sexually oriented, perverted cities of that time. It was a crossroads. So this is what Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. 
Now, in your bulletin, I've got another reference there that is a reference to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. You can read that later, but it reinforces, here again, what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. But let's look at how these sins are invading the church. And, and I, I hesitate bringing out names without solid proof, but I've got proof on this one. Andy Stanley, the son of the late Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley was a well-known, solid preacher. Andy Stanley is the lead pastor at North Point Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a best-selling author. He's a leader of pastors. He holds pastor conferences. Hundreds of pastors attend. He's an influence on thousands of pastors. He's an influence on tens of thousands of Christians, not only in our country, but around the world. It's Andy Stanley's view of homosexuality that we've got to address. This comes into question of what he's teaching, what he believes. And you need to be aware because he is now leading flocks astray. Andy Stanley has held conferences addressing the parents of the children of LGBTQ. In other words, he's there to help the parents deal with this. But that even though that sounds good, and these parents do need assistance, but according to the research substantiated, some of the conference speakers at these conferences were LGBTQ affirming pastor, or affirming speakers. They were promoting homosexuality. Digging deeper into where Andy Stanley stands on this practice of homosexuality, including same-sex marriages, Andy Stanley's doctrine comes into deep questioning. I want to read a quote by Al Mohler, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He stated this in a podcast, and I quote, As a theologian, I just feel a responsibility to say that what this represents is a departure from historic, normative, biblical Christianity. I think both sides understand this is the most basic disagreement we could imagine. So are sex and gender. It's over ontology and being. It's over Scripture. The authority of Scripture and the interpretation of Scripture. It's over God and the gospel. It just doesn't get any more basic than this. But I do recognize the gravity of the words I'm using when I say that what we see here is a departure from historic, normative, biblical Christianity. I say that because I believe that's exactly what it is. And I believe Christians ought to take note on it. Now, it sounds to me like Dr. Moeller's stand is solid with the beliefs that we have here, at least in the leadership of the congregation. Surprising, however, Andy Stanley has said that he never did buy in to Dr. Moeller's Christianity. He even said that Moeller's view of Christianity is why many people are leaving Christianity and leaving the church. As I read the Bible and study the words of Jesus, I don't find that case to be true. Jesus even drilled down, and people left him, his following. They were there for the show, and Jesus gave them a hard teaching, and they, a lot of them left. He even questioned his disciples, do you want to leave too? And they said, no. They believed in him. Stanley said that people who struggle with same-sex attraction are convinced traditional marriage is not for them. And trying to pin Stanley down on his views is like trying to capture a greased pig, if you remember those days at the fair. Another person from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Andrew Walker, he's a professor of ethics and public theology. He said that Andy Stanley is attempting to t make a distinction between doctrine, that is biblical truths, and pastoral practice. We cannot do that. In some, some ways and sometimes, I wish the Bible was a little bit softer in some areas. But that doesn't change the message that I have to deliver. 
I don't want everybody or so many people to go to hell, but it's what Jesus taught. We either follow him or not. In her book, Shepherds for Sale, Megan Basham writes that Andy Stanley has said of himself regarding homosexual marriage that if his granddaughter should happen to want to be married to the same sex, he would probably do it. That says a lot about Andy Stanley. But then he added that he realizes he might be in the wrong to let his experience dictate his theology. Well, I'll tell you, Andy Stanley is very, very, very wrong. You can research more on Andy Stanley. It's easy to find on the Internet. But one of the most worrisome things about Andy Stanley is he is considered one of the most ten influential preachers in our country. What he is teaching and what he is saying is highly impacting churches across the country and around the world. But Andy Stanley is not the only one. There are other major names, pastors that you would be shocked to hear. And as I've researched it, to state this on social media, which we are live streaming, I'm not going to do it. I don't have the evidence for it. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll name their names. But as reporters and other pastors have questioned these individuals, and these are famous people, famous pastors, famous authors, you would know their names instantly. As reporters and other Christians and pastors have questioned these people, they too are like trying to catch a greased pig. They say, well, the Bible says this, but then they say, well, they beat around the bush on what they believe. They won't answer it. So I encourage you that if you're following a preacher online or you've got favorite authors that are claimed to be Christians, please do some research online. Now, you've got to be careful online because online really can get stretched out of proportion and there's a lot of false things on the Internet. Do your research and document it well of what you're reading is true. But my guess is you're going to be shocked over some names that are going to come up that are being hard pushed to nail down just what they do believe. I tell you these things because Satan is in the church. He's in and being welcomed. He's being fed a meal by churches and Christians as they change the doctrine and theology of the Bible. You know, those words scare a lot of people. Doctrine and theology, we don't like to, we don't like to hear that. But it's the basis of what we believe. We can't pick and choose. It just cannot be done. So I've, I've explained the problem to you. So what's the answer? Well, the answer comes down to me. The answer comes down to our elders. The answer comes down to you. The answer comes down to Christians everywhere and what we believe and how willing we are to stand for Christ in the Bible. Let me pick on myself first. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He says, you, however, Timothy, I'm putting Timothy's name in there, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Let me rephrase that. I am mixed up. Okay, yeah. What you heard from me, keep on the pattern of sound teaching with faith, love, in Christ Jesus. We have to preach and teach these things that are truths that are grounded in the Bible. We go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Let's go to 2 Timothy. There we go. I, I got lost in my notes. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. These are hard truths. This is sound teaching. These are things that we have to depend upon and go with. We go to 2 Timothy. Let's see, that was 2 Timothy. Where were we at here? My notes are mixed up. Put that last one back up there, Craig. Pardon? Okay, 1 Timothy 4. Six. Okay, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a, a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourishing in the truths of the faith and the good teaching 
that you have followed. So in other words, it, it basically comes down to sound doctrine that I must teach. It comes down to truths of the faith. It comes down to sound teaching. That's dependent upon me. I have to teach what the Bible says, not what I want it to say, but what I read I need to present to you. These are my requirements, and I have to hold true to that, and the elders have to hold me true to it. For the elders, we return to Paul's letter, but now we go to Titus chapter 1, verse 9. This is one of the requirements of the elders. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. An elder must be firm to the teaching. He must step up to refute, step up to disprove false doctrine. And he must be able to guide people back to Jesus Christ, not merely as a pastor or as an elder to say, well, this is the way it is, and this is what it is. What it is, you, you got to refute. You got to give proof. You've got to give guidance to bring people back, and we do it in love. We're battling Satan. We've got to step up to the battle. We've got to be ready to help the flock stay firm in Christ. And we got to bring the flock back to Christ, especially when Satan attempts to destroy it. So. I must stay true to sound doctrine. The elders have to stay true to sound doctrine. We have to teach it. And what about you? How do you hold firm to the teachings of the Bible? We go to Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do the best, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God. Do your best to meet God. The Greek word for do your best is spudason. Spudason. Not impressive, but it means to be eager, to make every effort, to do one's best, as the NIV says. It means to be enthusiastically eager. I mean, really Enthusiastic, such as you're enthusiastic to be a sports fanatic, to, to be enthused about your kids or your grandkids. We're to be enthusiastically eager in reading and studying the Bible. We're to make every effort to stay firm. In other words, we have to sometimes give up the fun things. You got some idle time on your hands instead of doing some fun things? Well, read the Bible. Study it. It means studying to fill oneself with God's truths. This is not just for pastors and teachers and elders. It's for everyone, from the, uh, the, the youngest of Christians to the most mature of Christians, for everyone to read the Bible, study the Bible, and engage so that you can fight off Satan. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, to go to all the world and teach and to baptize and then to teach. In other words, it isn't just ended once we got them in the baptistry. We have to keep teaching them. It's a job for all of us. It's a job for me. It's a job for the elders. It's a job for you. And it's a job for every Christian out there. It's a dual purpose of the reason we have to study so that we can refute Satan, so that we can bring others to Christ, so that we can guide them to the right steps of Christ, but it's also so that we don't go off the narrow path. It's, it's so that we understand the truth of the Bible when somebody comes to us with this slight bent away from the biblical teaching and says, well, this is okay. No, it isn't. We have to stay firm so that we do not get sucked into half-truths. The Bible warns us to beware to saints and ploys. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, writes in his letter, Jude chapter 1, verse 4, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. I hope and pray they're not in this congregation. There's none that I know of. But you know of these people who 
thwart the word of God. They're co-workers. They're relatives. They're friends. They might be business people or your customers. They're people that will sneaking and connivingly try to drag you off. Whether it's intentional or not, it's from Satan. And until you and I know the true words of the Bible, theology and doctrine, we're liable to be distracted and drawn off. So we've all got a job to do. I, as a pastor, the elders, as your spiritual leaders also, and you, to watch out for one another and yourself. Seek God. Truly, truly seek God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there's not a one of us who have not sinned. There's not a one of us here that is innocent. We're all sinners, but we have to conform ourselves to the way of Jesus Christ. And Father, this congregation here depends upon me. I need your help through your Holy Spirit. I need you with me. The elders need you with them. They too must be rock solid in their beliefs. And they are. I am very, very pleased with our elders. Our teachers must be rock solid. And we as individuals must be rock solid. Help us to teach, preach, true biblical knowledge. Give us wisdom in presenting it. Give us love, the love of Jesus. Jesus never got angry with sinners. He only got angry with those that were leading people astray, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders. Help us to love the sinners, but help us to stand against those who are deceiving. It's in Jesus Christ, your Son's name that we pray. Amen.